you for joining us here for this oral history project. My name is Rebecca Hartwig. I'm a lecturer in the nursing department at Augsburg University, and I just need to confirm that you consent to be interviewed and to have the recorded interview stored at Augsburg, which will be made available to the public. I consent. Could you please introduce yourself for the recording, your name and title? Sure. My name is Chef Judah. Short mm -hmm. and simple. My real name is Jean-Claude Patrice Nataf, but uh, my professional name is Chef Judah. Thank you. So, just to begin, can you tell us a little bit about where you grew up? Okay. Uh, I was born in a small country in North Africa called Tunisia. I was born in the city of Tunis. Um, I come from a mixed uh, heritage of Sephardic Jewish and Arab. I believe my Sephardic Jewish family lived in Africa since probably around the 700s. Um, but then most uh, notably they were asked to leave in 1492 and uh, they ended up in Morocco and uh, after a few centuries made their way to Tunisia. And so that's where I come up on the scene in Tunis. Okay, thank you. So what was your life like when you were growing up? Sure. Um, oh, uh, my life was uh, challenging. I was, um, I just tell people simply I was a barefoot child beggar kind of to encapsulate and give you the idea and I just sometimes I just ask people to remember maybe movies or documentaries they might have seen where tourists and are in countries poor countries and the children are all mobbing mobbing them for money and, and all that and that's kind of like that was kind of my life and I had my own little group of our gang if you will um, and that's what we did we um, we were hungry and uh, so we would um, we would bother the British tourists especially because they were really rich and we would um, beg for money of course and and sometimes unfortunately we stole from them. I'm not proud of that but th that's what we did, you know. So my life was kind of like that. My uh, family, for reasons I didn't know then, just wasn't very um, active and taking care of me. I only figured out later in life the all the dynamics and reasons why that was. Um, so the first eight years of my life was spent in in Tunisia, again, kind of a challenging existence, and um, just a lot of stuff happening. Um, I spent some time in a Catholic orphanage in the north of the country. It was run by the Sisters of St. Vincent de Paul. And again, my family was so dysfunctional that I didn't realize it was an orphanage until I was an adult. I thought it was a boarding school. Uh, but I ran away from this orphanage quite a lot because there was stuff going on there that wasn't uh, pleasant. So. Um, until one fateful day in 1967 when I actually ran to the orphanage and I didn't come out until I was adopted and left the country in 1968. Tell us about that day. June 5th, 1967. Unbeknownst to me, a war had started in the Middle East. I didn't have any ideas about it and I didn't even have any ideas of what I was. I was so, uh, I won't say stupid, but I was ignorant. I didn't know Jewish, I didn't know Muslim or Arab at all, but on that day um, when I went to work in the streets and meet my little gang, it was just a different situation, an angry mob uh, for some reason that I didn't realize then started to chase me and stone me and stuff, of which I bear all the scars on my face, but um, it was a scary time for me. I was little, I was just had turned seven, and um, so then at that point I made my way to the orphanage and like I said I stayed there. I did not leave the gates of the, of the walls of the orphanage until in uh, 1968, I believe it was August. Tunisia was the only country in Africa to be occupied by the Nazis. And so when the Nazis came down and occupied Tunisia, my family did different things but my one aunt um, was in the French resistance so she did all this stuff. So when the uh, US Army and British armies liberated Tunisia, she kind of attached herself to the U.S. Army as an interpreter because she was multilingual. Mm -hmm. And that's where she kind of glommed on to a GI, and that was her ticket to America. You have to understand that that time frame and that place, a lot of people wanted to get out of this area, mm -hmm. <laughs> go somewhere else, anywhere but, and of course, America was the great beacon. So she came to Toledo, Ohio in 46. Time tr and then a few husbands later, she ends up with her new husband, uh, a Danish man, born in a small island in the Baltic, and they were on their honeymoon, and they were going to go to Paris, but it was the Paris garbage strike that year. The plane was diverted, and they ended up in Tunisia, and they came to see me at the orphanage because they had heard about me, and then they s 
wanted to adopt me. So that's um, the. I remember the day that Mother Superior came to me with these presents, and it was two presents that I'll always remember. Keeping in mind, I didn't have anything. Uh, it was a Mickey Mouse watch mm-hmm. and a pair of Fruit of the Loom underwear. <laughs> and as a kid, I saw those things, and like I'm like, I want more of this. And so I was um, very eager to leave that place, mm-hmm. to leave. So um, Mother Superior told them that I would be a blessing to them. So my aunt being very superstitious, because Tunisia is a very superstitious place, and my I know my family, which was a mishmash, my grandfather was Sephardic Jewish, my grandmother was Italian Catholic, they were 25 years apart. They fell in love and lived in a in an environment that was hostile to both of them. It was a Muslim environment that didn't like either group, but they loved each other and seven children. But superstition all mixed in, Italian, Catholic, uh, Islamic, Jewish, all kinds of, the evil eye was everywhere, the malocchio, you had to do all these signs to ward it off and wear amulets. So my aunt was superstitious, and so, not superstitious, but when Mother Superior said he'll be a blessing to you, she'd like, oh yeah, let's, let's get this, let's take this guy out of here. And so, just notably, I had my first pair of shoes for the airplane ride. And, wow. um, so, yeah. And that's how you came to the U.S. then exactly. when you were about eight? Eight years old, yes. Wow. So, okay. it was um, kind of going from one universe to another. I can see. And I remember, well, first of all, the plane trip, everything. And in those days, you could go in the cockpit, and uh, the captain would give you this little wings. And it was very exciting. But I always remember, I write stories about Americanization, or at least me, when I stepped off the plane and was in the airport and when those big glass doors opened and I saw America, I saw a thousand cars there and my adoptive father, Ben Larson, worked for Ford Motor Company. So he had this huge straddle cruiser. I don't know what make, I think it was a Continental, this huge car. And so for me, little brown skin guy who just came from begging in this vehicle and my face is pressed to the window of the cars we're going through the rolling hills of of the suburbs of Detroit we're going to Bloomfield Hills which was a very well off suburb to a condominium called Fox Hills uh, I remember seeing this undulating hills of green and I didn't know really what that was. I come from a place where every little scrap of land that you could grow food on or was used for that. So I asked my aunt, I didn't know English then, I said, Kiska Sisa, you know. And she goes, Oh that's grass. She explains it to me. And when she tells me that it, it wasn't food, it wasn't flowers for the perfume industry, it wasn't anything. It was just there for looks, I thought then this is like the promised land. This is what I'd heard of. Mm-hmm heard little things as a child you hear about America and how it's awesome and that was like oh yeah this is this is it so and then I sh- we show up to my new home condominium and I had my own bedroom and there was a TV in every room and so that was a very it was an initial a very shocking for me and I slept with my shoes for a whole month because I was afraid somebody was going to steal them and then they convinced me nobody was going to steal your shoes it's okay <laughs> and so that was my introduction to America you finished high school and oh um, well I uh, I was eight years old and really up to that time I had had no formal school and there was something at the orphanage we learned we're learning French Arabic script uh, but when I came to America I was sorely behind uh, the American system of education mm-hmm. I'm not sure what grade I would have been put in but I was behind I had mm-hmm. to learn English first sure. and so I had learned English really quickly um, but in, in learning my English so quickly, I had actually pushed aside my French language. It was still here, but I, had, I wanted to be American so much that, mm-hmm. and my parents did not encourage any uh, bilingualism really for me. Uh, so a year and a half later though, I had just learned English, then we moved to Japan. <laughs> oh. And so then there was another uh, kind of a, another cultural shock um, for me. Exciting as a kid and being an executive brat, mm-hmm. In a moment it was exciting, but it's only in retrospect that I realized that what I really, 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 really wanted was just to stay put in one place and, and just, you know, and uh, in the time that I was with my adopted parents, this eight years I was with them, we moved six times, Wow. six schools, mm-hmm. six places, six, so I was always the new kid, always, <laughs> mm-hmm. and that wasn't really... 
you what I really, in Japan for? We were there for three years. Three years and I even know. in Japan, we moved twice. Wow. <laughs> I came okay. back. Yeah. That's and, a lot of transition. And it wasn't until 1976 when uh, they wanted to go to Japan again, and I, I did not want to go again. I just mm-hmm. so uh, just uh, the way things happened. Um, my mom had learned about this. Um, my adoptive mom had learned about a um, a, ca- a Quaker school boarding school in the Appalachians, and that's where I went. To finish high school. Yes, my junior and senior year, which was really wonderful. That was great. Yeah. 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 I love the Quakers. And then then how did you end up in Minneapolis? Sure. Um, I finished um, 78, I graduated, and then I um, and then I was lucky as an executive brat. uh, My present was a trip around the world, literally. I went to Asia and then Europe and then came back to America and a new car, which I returned because I was in this phase of rebelliousness and I didn't want this, This, you know, of course now I'm thinking, gosh, I was stupid. It was a nice sky blue Mustang retro, oh my God. But um, I was just in rebellion stage and I said, oh, take your filthy car back. So I went to Urban College for one year mm-hmm. in Richmond, Indiana. It was Quaker based, okay. so there was connections and that. And my year at Earlham, my one and only year at Earlham was <laughs> the best, funnest year of my life. But I wasn't a good student at mm-hmm. all. And I figured out I just wasn't wired for academics at that point. I was just too antsy, and I just wanted to go to California because that was what we were doing then. You went to California, whatever your questions were, they would be answered in California. So I packed up all my stuff and started hitchhiking from Richmond, Indiana, to make my way to California. On that route, I ended up in Madison, Wisconsin, where a good friend of mine from Quaker School, a. Brybeck said, you know what? You should stop in Minneapolis, St. Paul. It's really cool. And hmm. so that was 1979. And I never made it to California. Oh, wow. You've been here ever since. With trips, I've lived in the Panhandle, Florida. I've lived in Arizona. And I went to Hiroshima University. But um, Minneapolis, St. Paul became my nest, my, my mm-hmm. central place to go back to always. Mm-hmm. You know, so. so what did you do in Minneapolis? Uh, boy, when I first rolled into town, uh, I remember my first night I spent in McAllister College. I had one friend there, and they were having a housing shortage, so there was kids sleeping in the hallway. So I blended in, and then the next day there was a board that had housing and jobs, and I was able to find a room for rent, and I was able to find a job in the cafeteria of McAllister. And so I did that uh, for a while. And this job entailed me going to two different addresses every day, to help elderly people and stuff mm-hmm. like that and um, taking the bus system and one day I, I took the wrong bus or the right bus whatever you might call it but I ended up on the west bank of Minneapolis see all my jobs were in St. Paul mm-hmm. so when I got off that bus in the west bank of Minneapolis in 1979 I looked around and I thought this is really where I need to be <laughs> um, just to quote Bob Dylan um, there was music in the cafes at night and revolution in the air it was still palatable then mm-hmm. Um, it's been transformed since then. It was just a real cool place, and um, so I, I was a gypsy. I moved around quite a lot. I'm not sure if it was the influence of my childhood where we moved so much, but I found it hard to be sedentary, and so it's just various jobs, you know, here and there, and took a few courses here, at school, trying to get more uh, academics. But um, I wasn't a very good student mm. at all, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so. A lot of ways of learning. Right. I guess I learned a lot other ways, certainly. Um, Mm -hmm. I just wasn't that good academic. I wasn't wired (laughs) for it. So here we are at Soup for You already, and I'm not quite sure when that... I don't really know the history of Soup for You. Oh, sure. Well, a lot of things happened in my life. I moved around a lot. Japan a few times. Pensacola, Florida, Panhandle. I love my... America experience is really great because it's such a huge country, and I feel blessed that I was able to you know, get the feel of different parts of it, the Midwest, Mm -hmm. the South, scary, the Southwest. So, uh, odd jobs, Um, of course, I had a little apartment in Stevens Square, and I had a job where I had to get on the bus, and the bus would go over the Franklin Bridge to take me to Minimatic, Uh, and it was an okay job. I got a paycheck every week, and I was able to have a place and food on the table, Um, and I would be on this bus going this way and that way, back and forth. And each time we went over the bridge, I would look down. And back then, at least, I would see things down there like tents and 
things and people. And I wondered, naively, I thought those were people just camping or fishing for fun. Mm -hmm. um, I never thought once that I might be one of those people down mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. So one day when I went to work and got my paycheck, I was told because I was like the new, the new people got laid off. And so uh, paycheck away. Uh, I lost my place eventually because obviously I couldn't, I didn't have any money, I didn't have a support mm -hmm. structure, I didn't have family, my family was thousands of miles away, I had no really friends that were able to help me and so I, um, I spent um, quite a few weeks just sleeping on the buses, like the 21A, mm -hmm. uh, but then I started to go to the free eating places and that's where I hooked up with people that said, well, you know, you could live you know, and so I ran into two people. One was a Vietnam vet, and one, well, I don't know what he did. He was a railroad guy. Uh, but we had a structure. They had a structure, and I became part of this little three-man group okay. of living under the bridge. What years were those under the bridge years? It was the late 80s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes mm -hmm. it's a fog, but that land belonged to the railroad. But if you, as a person, as a homeless person, wanted to live down there, you actually had to pay some rent to this group called the Freight Train Riders of America, FTRA, a notorious group that rides the rails, um, just a lot of psychos and Vietnam vets with a lot of problems, but you had to pay them something. You could pay them in different ways. And mm -hmm. so I liked it. And for that, they gave you a lot. They provided security and they provided justice. And I give the example of um, one time we were able to go to Mary Jo Copeland's and we were able to get these nice galoshes mm -hmm. for all three of us. And that was important, you know, your feet and mm -hmm. the slush and all the crap. And so um, we had them in our uh, encampment and we weren't using them then, but uh, one day we came back and they were gone. And so long story short, the FTRA or the Goon Squad, they found out who stole our, our galoshes. And they chopped their thumb off. Oh. And so that was an introduction to, this is kind of, this is real here. Uh, this is for real. This is a real subculture, and it's very serious. And there's a structure, and there's rules and stuff, and you don't break the rules. If you do, you end up without a thumb. And so that was kind of a, a, an awakening for me that this was, you know, serious stuff. Mm -hmm. Just saying. Mm -hmm. Because not having shoes can cost you your toes, your feet, so yes. you don't steal those things from anybody, and anyway, yeah. Um, yeah. Homelessness, finally was able to make it out. I got a voucher to live at a place called the Tourist Hotel on Ninth and Hennepin, hmm. a long time ago. Now I think it's called the New Amsterdam something. It's above this bar, this disco bar. I lived there a couple years, ended up uh, coming to the West Bank. I lived on the West Bank eight years. Uh, and in those eight years, I would walk from my apartment to the co-op, the old North Country co-op, and I would always walk by this place it's called St. Martin's Table. Until one day, I went to the co-op, and then there used to be a big kiosk with all these things on it, and it said, dishwasher wanted. I had things going on then, um, but I, okay, I could use more money, so I went in to apply for the dishwasher job. So um, I'm happily doing the dishes, and then one day during a rush, um, one of the women, the cooks, uh, threw me a recipe card and said, Judah, could you please help? So I looked, okay, it's a cheese spread. I, I did it and I thought, oh, you know, mm -hmm. I could, you know, this is okay. Mm -hmm. And so then I slowly segued into uh, making soups. And uh, St. Martin's Table was important because that's where I met my future wife-to-be for 10 years. And of course, my, I wouldn't have had my child, Esther, had I, that not happened, but um. Then, of course, there's a side story because, I don't know if you know my wife, my ex-wife Karen had a traumatic brain injury. This was 18, 19 years ago. Um, I married her after her accident. I had to identify her at the hospital. It's kind of, uh, but that's when I became Esther's papa, and that was one of the biggest joys of my life. Um, so 15 years later, St. Martin's Table closes. <laughs> and, so, um, and so I thought, what shall I do? Well. While I was at St. Martin's Table, I had started a little thing called Soup For You. And it was a small catering thing, just a one-man operation for doing um, soup suppers for churches and nonprofits usually. Um, so I had that uh, going on. So when St. Martin's closed, I wondered what was I going to do with myself. I didn't want to sit by the phone waiting for people to call me. 
And then one day I was just walking in my neighborhood and there was a CSA truck dropping off stuff and I thought to myself, hmm, soup CSA, soup CSA, I wonder if that could work. You know, people pay me money up front, they get uh, 30 soups for 30 weeks, that was my slogan. And then I thought, okay, so I started the groundwork for that all summer and then I needed the space. And just by happenstance, uh, Mary Laurel True was friends with Pastor Justin, so uh, that was six years ago. And Pastor Justin said, yeah, sure, so allowing me to use the, the kitchen for my thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, But I knew something was up because when they gave me the contract to sign, um, I noticed that they gave me a 96% discount on the rent of the, of the kitchen. Of the kitchen. Right. And I wow. thought, wow, you know, something's, what's going on here? Because this was two years before Super For You Cafe. Mm -hmm. I had no really, that wasn't in the plans yet. I was just going to try to make a, an honest living. And actually that coincided with um, my marriage breaking up. <laughs> so uh, it was really important that I had something going on. Um, mm -hmm. So Pastor Justin, uh, and even with Pastor Justin, I started the conversation about, you know, could we have a free meal in this space, you know, like once a month? And so he agreed, and then he uh, talked to the congregation. They agreed, uh, but then he left to go to Augsburg. Um, then we had an interim pastor, and there's been five pastors. So cut to the chase, uh, Pastor Mike Matson was the one. Um, when I told him my idea, he was very gung-ho, and I understand he was young and very eager. Mm -hmm. And so he, he talked to the congregation. They said, okay, and of course it morphed from one meal a month to every day of the week. It's five days a week. Yeah, five days a week. Yeah. Five days a week Yes, now. and okay. now they started where in the last two months we had one Sunday that to uh, join the uh, the five days a week Soup for You community with the Bethany Sunday community, which sometimes never met. Mm -hmm. So we started in a Sunday meal once in a while to get those two groups together to say hi. So it, it started out as a, a for-profit for you. you well, it was my little living. sole proprietorship. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. for the first two years, it was uh, yeah about 70 people would come on a Friday or Saturday to pick up one quart jar or two quart jars of soups. Yes. So yeah, but now since the cafe part, my little thing has kind of gone to the back burner, pun intended. It's not altruistic. It makes me feel good. People think, oh, you're such. A... I get a lot out of it. I really do. So you have to come in every day pretty early to get soup started? Well, I get up between 5.30 and 6.30 every day, try to make it out the door by 7-ish. Mm -hmm. uh, but really, my whole time at St. Martin's Table was really training for... I was younger then. I would come into St. Martin's at 6.30. I would bake 12 loaves of bread. I would do a couple desserts. I would do the soups. I would do spreads, salad dressings. <laughs> I was able to do a lot. So I'm able to do a lot in just, let's say, three hours. Do you know what foods you're going to have to, to use? Interesting question. Um, it's A lot of times it's like Splendid Table mm -hmm. because uh, we're allowed to cull from the co-op. My uh, cull team, John and Sarah, uh, I don't know what they're bringing. Or in the morning when I come in, I really don't know what's going to be there. Every morning. So the first thing I look and see, what do we have? Um, but then you know we have Chili Friday, so it's always going to be on, you know, chili on Friday, get curried away Thursday, curry soup, um, um, so those days, but it's just a challenge to just make something out of what you have and that's really kind of purposeful and that's a reflection of most of the world. They get up in the morning, they might not have a lot of choices about what they're going to eat or... Yeah, once you've experienced hunger, you, you never forget it at all and it's a fear in the back of your mind all the time and sometimes I find myself hoarding things which so like, oh, chill Judah, chill, it's, you're going to have, it's okay. But it's just that mindset that you um, you never lose, um, and then on top of that, I have a I really care about people eating. You know, one question I ask people when they're leaving, I go, "Did you get enough?" You know, I'm like one quarter Jewish grandmother. <laughs> so that's right, like right. Yeah. Oh well, yeah. the reason I, as a nursing instructor, enjoy bringing my community health students here is because. I like them to see what's happening yeah. in the in a community as far as health and how soup for you brings yeah. health to people who come in off the streets. Right. Not all homeless, right. but tell me just a bit about the people who do. Come right. To well, soup for you. it's a, I called and I used to use that word a lot. Radical soup kitchen, because we invite everyone, whether you own a bank or whether you 
come in with a plastic bag with all your belongings in it. But as you know, also walking through the doors, a lot of mental health issues, a lot of substance abuse issues, and a lot of other ghosts that we don't know. Um, have people shot up in our bathrooms? Yes. Have people shot up next to the church? Yes. Have people drank? Have people lost their minds here? Yeah. Um, so to be a volunteer at St. Martin's, uh, St. Martin's <laughs> at Soup for You, it's not like being at Denny's. I need my volunteers to be discernful, to try to understand that we do get many broken people walking in. We're broken ourselves, but, you know, I can give you two examples that come to mind. And one is um, last year this woman came in and she started to be a regular, but would give her her soup and she would pour her bowl of soup into her plate and eat it that way. And so we don't judge. We just notice it's different. And so after a few months, um, I decided, you know what? So I looked around and I found an oval bowl. And so when she came in one day, I served her with the bowls of soup in that oval bowl. And I brought it to her and I remember she cried. Mm. And she wasn't crying because she was sad, but she was crying because it's like, wow, you noticed what I was doing and you didn't judge one way or another you just gave me a way to do it better so I'll always remember that and she will tell people that story a lot <laughs> about how that happened that one day um, oh there's so many stories uh, more recently a few months back we're working in the hubbub and then I noticed one gentleman a youngster blonde hair blue eyes just standing there just staring straight and so I go to this gentleman and I started, you know, how you doing? Welcome. And, and he couldn't speak very well at all. He was struggling. So we just guided him to a chair and sat him down. And then we just brought him food. But it, he's someone that would just break your heart because he had motor skills problems. He couldn't speak very well. And he would come in on top of his all his issues. He would come in with garbage he'd picked up in the street. Mm -hmm. And last week he came in with a dead baby bird in his hand. So there's a lot of dynamics going on. And then I remember one day he was going to leave and he was just standing there and I said, do you want a hug? And he indicated, yeah. So I gave him a hug. And so I started to do that, but I noticed when I hugged him, I felt really drained so I don't do it so much now. But that's just an example. This isn't like a, a, red, a place that you're going to find anywhere else. There's so much going on here. And we try to, you know, if somebody comes in with sandals in December, then we rush around trying to find shoes for them, things like that, you know. Wow. It's not just about a lot. It takes a lot for that if moment when you get your plate and your bowl of soup. It takes a lot to get to that point, but it's not just about that. It's very all-encompassing very holistic yeah. very holistic and we get to know people's ways and idiosyncrasies and quirkinesses and we and there's a lot of needy people out there I'm needy myself but we recognize there's a lot of needy people and to some it might seem like it's annoying but you just have to understand that's really they just want attention and love and just uh, acknowledgement or often authentication that you're a human being you know that's why I have my people's cooler it's kind of like a little food shelf but we don't ask people to fill out forms or you know show ID I've always wondered about that why do we even have to prove to a food shelf that what you're a human being and you're hungry why, why do we need to dehumanize people mm -hmm. further um, mm -hmm. yeah would you say that a lot of your guests are, are regulars that come yes. and yeah. feel this is kind of a home? Oh, most definitely. The polar vortex, people came. Our numbers stayed up high. Um, also, just this morning, as an example, we opened the door, and in 15 minutes we had 20 people. Wow. So people do look forward, and that means a lot to me mm -hmm. because we are literally the farthest outpost of, of a free meal. Mm -hmm. So the fact that people do come, you know, I get a lot of joy out of, of course, people eating good, healthy food. Uh, but I get a joy out of hearing the snippets of 12 conversations. I want people to converse. You know, at the St. Martin's Table, it was books, food, conversation. Here it's food and conversation. 
but just the idea that people are interacting in that way and, and, and making friendships that they wouldn't have made, relationships, that means a lot to me. I've never been here without um, having a good conversation <laughs> with somebody and leaving feeling like I've really gained something <laughs> from that myself. Well, as I say, you know, the old show was uh, there's a thousand stories in the Naked City. Mm-hmm. We've got a lot of them down there. And just over the four years, there's been so many stories. And a lot of, you know, just like joys, you know, we're trying to get into a house, a place, you know. But then also we have lost. Like, uh, he started to come like maybe three and a half years ago, he would come, and uh, he always sat by himself at first because he was sober, and that's the price you pay for being sober. You have to stay away from people. So he came, and we got to know each other, joke, and very polite. Um, then he didn't come for a while. Then he showed back up, but he was with a group of people, and he wasn't sober. But fine, we feed people, as long as you're not disruptive or hurting anybody. Um, then it came a time, though, I had to ask him to leave. And as I usually do, I never banish people forever. I will say one month, two months. I gave him a little slip of paper and had a date on it, which was two months from now. And I said, you know, I love you. Come back in two months. Because I live three blocks away and I have a huge window and just being in my neighborhood, I would see him sleeping on bus benches or or drunk. Or one day I saw him with two black eyes. You know, it it killed me inside. But it's it was unavoidable. So it was the Sunday before the Monday that he was he could come back and he was by the highway with a sign and he saw me and he goes you know chef judah tomorrow right tomorrow of course i was like wow you know i said yes tomorrow you know so um then that monday morning i come into work early it was a rainy stormy morning and i always look on the sides of the building first to see if anybody's you know but then i noticed under one of the awnings there where people do sleep there was and so, to me, not only did he keep that little slip of paper, but he wanted so much to come back here that he was hugging our building in the midst of a rainstorm. He spent that night there. Mm. So, you know, I mean, that struck me inside. It's, <laughs> how can it not affect you? Mm-hmm. So he came back, and we, he knew we would welcome him back. Mm. He came, and he always had a good friend named Dan. Dan, they were like this. They were combat marines in the Vietnam War, and they've been together since. They came together. And then one day a rumor started that somebody had OD'd, and it was somebody from soup for you Didn't know for a week or so. And then finally one day Dan did come, and Dan said, you know, I woke up one morning and, and I thought that he had gone off, whatever. It wasn't un- until a couple of days later that Dan gets waken up by sirens and ambulances, and was just in the bushes a few feet away. Oh. Mm. So, yeah. he was born on the Rosebud Reservation. He was adopted, and he had a hard life. But mm-hmm. So we lose some. Yeah. And the danger, really, of all this is getting to know people. I don't mean that as a bad thing, but once you get to know people, you invest yes. your heart in them, mm-hmm. and you worry about them, and you look for them. Is he still alive? Is so he, he hit all of us hard, you know, because, um, mm. so that's just one little story of, mm, thank of you for sharing what that. happens, you know, you know, but then there's a lot of moments where it's like Judah, you can't help everybody. Yeah. So what would you think would you like to see with the future? Because this has come a long ways in four years. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, the first year we did 10,000 bowls, and now we're at 71,000 bowls, so we've exponent not exponentially, but we're growth, growth, growth. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to continue. I wanted to expand uh, our services in a way, in some ways. I mean, food is still the main food and providing a safe space. Mm-hmm. You know, we have that guest book, mm-hmm. and I think I might have shown you. I mean, there's all kinds of love in that guest book, but the one little statement that really struck, stuck, struck me was, just said, I feel safe here. Wow. Savannah. I remember this very mm-hmm. frail gal who has moved on. Uh, but I thought that's really, that's what we want. That's what it's about. You know, and I use the term all the rainbow, and I, that's purposely. Uh, mm-hmm. All the rainbow should be, we uh, not just welcome, but we invite people, come in, you know. Not just that we wait for you to come in and welcome you, we'll do that. But just want it to be a safe place. And it's kind of an experiment. Can it happen? Can it really 
can you have all these different people mm-hmm. cohabitating the space for just even two and a half hours? But so far, it seems to be working okay. Yeah. So. It was a shame, though, for all those years that that room just stayed quiet and dark and cold, mm-hmm. not used. And that was really what was getting to me was because I walk around my neighborhood, I see <laughs> just in my neighborhood, just the people needs. could benefit. Yeah, the need is there. Mm-hmm. And not just that I recognize people from the old days, wow, you're still alive. But, <laughs> you know, the people down mm-hmm. there that have problems and issues, they, they don't want to be like that. You know they don't. Mm-hmm. And so... There's always that um, sim- sympathy or empathy or compassion that you know they don't want to be like that. Of course not. But you feel so much that, you know. Well, I've noticed nothing but respect, compassion. Well, thank you. Um, well, it's <laughs> top shelf soup, I'll tell you that. Well, keep coming, you'll <laughs> find some losers because <laughs> last week I didn't have hardly anything to work with, so it's... You know, one of the biggest compliments my daughter ever gave me was, you know, she goes, Papa, you're able to make something out of nothing. I said, that's the thing. You know, I, um, I thought, yeah, that's a good thing, <laughs> Esther. That's wonderful. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you so yeah, much for your daughter, time. Esther. And, oh, oh, she's beautiful. Yeah, oh, my goodness. How old is she now? Oh, 21 plus. Wow. Yeah, she's <laughs> Chinese, of course. Uh, my wife, my ex-wife adopted her. Before we were married, but I, I adopted Esther legally. She's beautiful. Yeah, she's my... It's kind of an irony of all things, you know. She's born in... We're born 10,000 miles, born in North Africa. She's in China. And then we... Our worlds intersect here. And how unlikely is that? Yeah, but she gives me something that I never had. And that's unconditional love. Mm. I think that's what we all want. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you, Shashita. Yeah, you're welcome.